Welcome back, everyone. We are all set for the panel discussion on rewriting the law of talent attraction with data analytics and AI. I know this sounds really interesting, so please join me in welcoming the esteemed panel of speakers, Rohan Sylvester, recruitment evangelist, indeed, Sridhar Akshantula, head transformation and TA at Wipro, Girish Venkatraman, VP HR, media.net, Pooja Kumar, recruitment head, Global Capability Centers, GSK, and Babu Vittal, Head People and Culture, ULA, as the session moderator. This surely is a multifaceted panel, so handing over the frame to Babu to moderate and lead the conversation. Nice to uh, see all of you here, and this I'm sure will be an interesting session. If not, we will make it interesting. Uh, so we, we are talking about rewriting the laws of talent attraction. Um, fundamentally, I have a question on the title itself. Like, uh, do we really control talent attraction? We are still at the mercy of candidates, but we are trying to build lot many systems, processes, steps. A couple of them, uh, data analytics, AI has come in very, very handy. And this is, we'll, we'll spend some time articulating about how it has helped and we'll go a little bit of uh, into detail. Uh, I, I see this session as merely exchanging notes, right? So looking at some of the best practices, what each one of us do in our respective organization. And we will we'll probably try and understand uh, much better. Uh, so that could help not just us and also the viewers in the long term we'll be able to solve for some of the talent attraction strategies right so um i i have a question uh, for you uh, puja around tech hiring and uh, tech enablement so tech enabled hiring has tons and tons of advantages right i mean you could reach out to candidates in no time earlier it is if you walk into campus it is just one campus today there are thousands of campuses within click of a button you could reach out and most importantly, not just about reaching out to candidate, the data what you collect, right? Not just campus, any candidates, the data what you collect throws in wonderful insights. We could start making stories, start implementing a lot based on the data coming out. The third perspective to tech enabled hiring, I see is the cost of hiring, right? The cost of hiring significantly coming down. Our bosses would definitely love us for this, right? When we say that here is one area where we reduce uh, the cost. And uh, this is a very, very interesting space to be in, a very, very interesting space for us to operate in. What are some of your experiences? And uh, um, I mean, how do you think this would evolve in the future if you could throw in some light? It would be more interesting. Yeah, sure. Um, I think that's a great question. And uh, to start off with, like what you said, talent attraction, right? So uh, it is all the employers who keep uh, attracting uh, candidates and it's totally a candidate market as of now with uh, especially in tech where we have seen a tremendous amount of uh, roles and a huge supply gap. So I think it's definitely talent attraction is the right uh, word, I would say, for the whole uh, process. Now, coming specifically to your question on the tech enablement hiring, right? And uh, I think that is the future of talent attraction, right? And if I have to just reflect back upon myself as to how I was, I started off as a recruiter about 20 years ago. Uh, I used to spend the whole day calling up candidates for either interview scheduling or for HR screening, right? And believe me, it was monotonous and we had huge teams just to do this candidate calling, candidate follow-up, right? But now uh, with technology coming in, I think all that is a thing of a past, right? We have uh, tools at every step, right? Like AI-enabled sourcing, which would help source uh, sourcers and recruiters pick out if they have got 100 applications for a job, which are the top 10 applicants that they should look at based on their past hiring experience, plus also based on the JD map. Right. So that is how uh, technology has enabled us. We also have uh, bought video interviews 
uh, we have coding tests which helps us uh, you know reduce the number of candidates that we are actually interviewing we have automatic calling facilities wherein just with the click of a button the uh, kind of a bot will inter will send out uh, the reminder to about 100 500 uh, candidates right so that's where i think technology plays a very uh, key role in uh, the future of recruitment and if I just have to talk about GSK itself here, uh, we actually use HackerRank, which is a great coding uh, tool because we are looking for top end coders, right? So we don't actually have to interview everybody. We get them to uh, take up these coding tests. And also we use HireVue for uh, video CD screening. So that saves us a lot of time. And um, like what the data shows, by adopting some of these tools, uh, companies have seen close to about 30% reduction in the cost, right? And uh, it's just not the cost dimension that technology enabled hiring focuses on, right? It is uh, improved candidate experience, improved uh, hiring manager experience, and also the speed, which is the essence of recruitment uh, in this war for talent and also the quality. So I think technology enabled hiring and new tools, which are also coming up in the market uh, for every aspect of recruitment is uh, definitely the future of talent attraction. Thanks, thanks, Pooja. I mean, very, very interesting perspective. Um, when, when we all did this, right, we, we all believe in having hundreds and 200 people in our team so that the more bigger the size of the team, the more better our contribution is, right? That's, that's not going to yeah. be the case in the future, I'm sure. I mean, we also need to continuously reinvent on this. Um, I'll, I'll take this question forward to uh, our panelists. Shridhar, uh, where we'll talk about tech hiring and tech enablement. Thanks, Babu. You know, that's a very, very pertinent question. Um, given the context of the current pandemic um, and the remote hiring that is that is required by most organizations, or, you know, maybe we even want to call it touchless hiring. Uh, in this context, this is uh, a very, very important question in terms of how technology can play a big role in terms of uh, hiring. Um, and I would like to look at it in from four areas. Now, there are four areas in the recruitment cycle where technology plays an important um, part. The first one is um, in terms of uh, attracting the best talent, right? You know, um, you know, most of the time the attraction, talent attraction, is based on um, you know active candidates who are available, whose resumes are available on various job sites um, and job portals. Um, however, there are um, many passive candidates who are available and who are willing to um, you know, get into uh, the hiring, you know, get into the opportunity if they see an opportunity which is attractive. Um, there are quite a few technology enabled um, mechanisms that are available to, uh, to attract good talent, uh, especially the passive talent. Uh, one of them is obviously the geo targeting um, uh, that is available. You know, this is essentially where you know you can specifically zoom in on a particular zip code or a particular you know uh, location and get uh, uh, targeted advertisements to people in that particular building or in that particular zone. Um, you know, if there are technology experts in a particular uh, building that you are aware of and that you want to attract, you know, you could you could use this technique and you will be sending targeted messages to them. And if they are uh, candidates who uh, are interested based on the message, they would definitely uh, join join uh, and, and get into the hiring process. Uh, so that is the first area, you know, attracting of the best talent. Uh, the second area, which is very, very important um, for hiring and the productivity of the recruiter perspective is the sourcing and screening. Now, this is one area where a lot of time goes in from the recruiter perspective, because, you know, they sift through all of these profiles and go through um, you know, profiles to find a perfect match for the particular opportunity. And a lot of times it involves uh, manually going through these profiles and that is how recruiters have been doing it. However, there are quite a few tools, uh, artificial intelligence based tools that are available in the market these days, which helps the recruiter in this space. And one of the things that this does is it not only gets you the right profiles, it also stack ranks you so that you can pick the top 10 profiles from a bunch of profiles that are available either in your own uh, database or in the sources that are you, that you are connected. You can get the top 10 profiles that are meeting your um, requirements and you can target them from you know, the ne ne technical evaluation, evaluation perspective. So that's the second area. The third area is in terms of uh, evaluation screening and you know, getting the right candidate fit based on um, 
the need, right? So there again, uh, with the remote hiring um, happening, you know, a lot of organizations face this challenge of, you know, um, how do we know that the right candidate is actually coming in for the interview? You know, is somebody else taking the interview instead of the candidate? So there are again tools here and technology plays a big part here. You know, there are uh, remote uh, authentication tools that are available. There are remote proctoring tools available. There are tools that will help you not only, um, you know, one way, there are two way video interviews available, coding um, on, you know, with, with the cameras on available. All of these techniques are uh, technology enabled uh, methods are playing an important role in, uh, you know, in the hiring process. And the last one, which is uh, from an organization perspective, very important is once the offer goes out to the candidate, you know, the candidate needs to be engaged. And this is very, very critical for an organization because, you know, every candidate who does not join is, um, is equal to um, uh, twice the effort that the recruiter has to put because the first effort has already gone in and that has gone down the drain. You need to find another person to fit in, fill in that role. Now, uh, here is an other question, um, Rohan, I'm just coming in to you uh, more to understand around uh, employer branding, right? So everything is taken on most importantly, um, like we say, the data is the new oil. Probably it's a five, six year old statement, but now data is the new data, right? I mean, and everything is centered around data. It, in your particular perspective, how do you think HR leaders, right? They can use this technology and the data, usage of not just technology in combination with data, and they could enhance the own culture. I mean, the culture has different perspectives. I'm talking about enhancing culture of employees. If you have some insights, you could also throw some insights about how employer brand also could be built based on this. So, Thanks, Babu. That's a great question. Uh, and, and considering my background, uh, if, where I'm from, Indeed, I work for Indeed as well. And, you know, our partner, sister company, Glassdoor, uh, we're a very data-driven organization. And we really believe that uh, we have actually, a, a, you know, one of our principles in our organization is if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. I mean, it's, uh, it's an old saying, but uh, I think we are living in a world where it, data and particularly technology plays a very crucial role in culture and employer branding. And I, and I think in the past, we've, we've given a pass to culture and employer branding and said they're nebulous things that we really don't need to measure. Uh, we don't need to understand it when, and understandably so. But now we, we as you, as I said, you know, everything has to have a bottom line at some level. So there are so many tools out there. There are social media tools that companies are adopting, uh, where people can communicate beyond, you know, the regular work hours and discuss stuff with their co colleagues. Uh, and you know, we do this at Indeed itself, where we have our own hashtag for our own employees to use, just to let people know how it's used and. And we use that hashtag to kind of put it out there into the world and let people know. So we're able to tag and track everything that we're doing. And, and it's not just that, right? From a cultural aspect and particularly during the pandemic. Um, now, pre the pandemic, when our leadership wanted to get word down to everybody, it was an email or it was a much longer process. It, it, it'll filter down through multiple levels. Now, once the pandemic hit, leaders started turning to technology because they knew they had to get in front of their employees and start addressing and it became a very cultural thing i think we've had more virtual town halls and virtual meetings because we knew that if culture has to sustain and grow and evolve uh, we need to get in front of it and 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 put all those values out there so a lot of companies are using different technologies to communicate and, and, and convey things to organizations as well. But when it comes to employer branding, I think the use of technology and, and, and data has not just understand, allowed us to understand how to share the information. It has also helped us understand which information to share. Uh, I think data has started to inform a lot of companies uh, you know, uh, what kind of information job seekers care about. For example, and I'm talking about Glassdoor, uh, in, in the back end of Glassdoor, you go in, you can actually see like word clouds and, and data on what people are talking about. Before, when we would talk to job seekers, we would just tell them, hey, this is why you should join us. 
this is what makes us great. Now we can look at the data and say, this is what job seekers are interacting with. They care about benefits and they care about, uh, uh, you know, growth paths and things like that. And, and now we know to tailor our messaging to tell this. And this all comes from technology and data. Uh, I, I think one really cool thing that we are starting to understand now is how our, our understanding of what job seekers want and what they really want can be very different things, especially when we are from a very different cohort. Uh, for example, pre-pandemic, if you had asked me, one of the things that you would have looked at before getting a job, uh, medical insurance would have been very low on my list of things to care about, right? And understandably, uh, very low on the list of everyone's things to care about. Now, post the pandemic, I, I remember first thing you did, we all did was go check and see what our coverage was and what extra coverage we can get. And now if I'm joining a new company, I definitely want to know that number. And, and the data is showing that. And obviously our branding has to change to accommodate for that. I'm not saying every company should now go out there and talk about their medical insurance, but the data shows that the things, people change and people's values change, people's principles change, and, and the data can potentially let us know where to take our own message and our own story. That's that's very interesting. I mean, in the 80s, when you had to buy a car, um, you look at add-on beautiful features like rear view mirror, right? Yeah. Now, <laughs> now uh, everything is part and parcel, but one thing is for sure, a couple of things based on what you said. Today, um, candidates come back and tell us like, hey, um, listen, I saw your rating in Glasgow. <laughs> when the conversation goes in those lines, you know that there is something wrong and you need to fix it. So that's one. Uh, second, you also spoke about uh, the virtual town halls, right? What made me happy and smiling when you spoke about virtual town hall is you still need an HR guy to run that virtual town hall. <laughs> <time. laughs> I'm pretty happy about it. Thanks. Uh, great insights, Arun. So, uh, get, uh, Girish, uh, a quick question to you. We, we spoke about some of those employee engagement, culture, branding, and how do we attract um, talent. Uh, one of the other pieces around training, I mean, not just you, I'm going to bring this question to all of you. Um, um, everything is remote, right? I mean, even this conversation is happening in a very, very remote way. Um, there's no way I could invite you to my office and show my hospitality, right? But those are the only ways we have known, at least over the last 15, 20, 30 years. So we've been working for the last two years. There's no way I can show the hospitality to you. All you have is this screen time, right? And face to face. And the brand ambassadors are the people who come and take interviews for you. Like you, you come sit in front of the screen and with whatever conversation you make, right? So that's, I think that's the only way you could communicate your brand to the candidate. Right? And I'm just wondering, would, would there be training which would play a very, very critical part here? Uh, does training have some scope or we just let our managers unleash, just go interview and come back. What are some of your thoughts? Thank, thanks for asking that, Rupal. I think my, my before, we, before I answer that question, I think my take is that this is this, it's not just about training. I think you right, rightly hit the nail on the head towards the end of your question. Like for instance, at media.net, we've had this distinct advantage of our own hiring process being remote or you can call it quasi-virtual even before the pandemic had set in, right? And most of our initial rounds typically are remote. It's always been remote. But having said that, yes, given the hyper-competitive talent landscape that we've seen in the last couple of years, we have had to revisit our own approach to hiring also in a lot of ways, right? Uh, simple things, like, like I mean, the most one of the things that has been extremely critical for us is inculcating an awareness amongst the recruiter, amongst the hiring manager, that you are being evaluated as much as you are evaluating the candidate, right? It's no longer an evaluation, which is one way. The other party is also evaluating you as much as you are. Getting those finer details right, right? To ensure immaculate candidate experience, that's no longer negotiable as I see it, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's something that right from, it's not up to the offer process, right up to the time you uh, engage with the candidate when he's onboarded, even thereafter, I think I think it's, it's like you have to be on your toes and get this completely right. 
that's one thing that we've done. The second thing that we've also possibly looked at is trying to completely reimagine this entire hiring process by keeping the candidate at the center of the design, right? Uh, traditionally, we've always had a process which is which has been more revolving around uh, key stakeholders in the organization. But I think one thing that we really changed is trying to keep also candidate at the center. Doesn't mean that we've, we've really stuck with a particular process and we designed and we stick to it. We're also learning because in the current team of things, we're also trying to see experimenting in various ways to see what exactly fits with the candidate and what does not. Uh, so for example, one of the things that we realized is you can't have a one size fits all process hiring process as far as candidates go. And so we ended up customizing the process itself as for the role of the candidate or the skills that they come to, with which they bring to the table. Another very interesting thing that we noticed, for example, is that uh, many candidates, in fact, when they have to take a decision whether they want to, these days when you have multiple offers, one of the parameters with which candidates go about choosing a particular company is the kind of problems that you end up solving for, the kind of challenges that you typically end up solving for in an organization. This is being asked for multiple times, especially in tech. Uh, but with this tech talent, we find this as a repetitive thing. And uh, so what we, we have, one thing that really clicks for us here is our own hiring process because the hiring bar itself is, it's like, it, it kind of, uh, it's fairly challenging. It asp it's fairly aspirational for the candidate and gives them a fair bit of an indication in terms of what kind of problems that they end up solving in case they end up joining the organization, right? So that, that really helps us. Of course, we do have the usual things in terms of ensuring that there's a product pitch that happens to the candidate, uh, explaining features of the product in which they'll be working. Now, but having said that, one other interesting uh, thing that we've done, because at the end of the day, you also, like you rightly said, we have to communicate the story in the short time that you have. And uh, one important aspect is who does that pitching, right? And who, who essentially does that pitch to really drive home the point with the candidate. One thing that really works for us is when we typically get, if you find the candidate has actually impressed us in the initial rounds, what we do is we let multiple teams to pitch for the same candidate. Now you may ask, well, how does it really help? Because it helps for the respective candidates. I mean, like you have the respective teams pitching for the same candidate and they put in their best foot in front of the candidate, right? And, and all of us know that the person who's most effectively able to communicate the brand story is typically whom you will call as a promoter who really believes in the organization and the story that you have to offer. And in addition to the hiring manager, what we've typically seen is uh, one other person who's, who's typically a great promoter would be all the people, all the employees who end up referring candidates to you, right? So again, they are that, that's another potential pool who feel is able to deliver the, the internal brand story far more effectively. Right, and hence we do pay a lot of emphasis in terms of promoting the employee referral as a channel, and that really helps us. One, uh, another important thing I want to share is like, what we really realized is we've not really tried to uh, script the approach that a hiring manager needs to take with a particular candidate, right? We let them to use their natural style, use their own respective strengths to build rapport with the candidate, right? And that, in turn helps them to understand what really clicks with candidates, what are the drivers of the candidates and helps them to play back to us in terms of uh, telling what exactly are the drivers. And then while well, we actually have to make offers, we are then able to package it in a far more holistic way rather than trying to make a transactional conversation at that stage. Uh, of course, now what this could mean is some, uh, some hiring managers possibly have better conversion rates. And the way we typically manage that is also to share those best practices and see how, how is it that we can get consistency in terms of the success that we achieve. That's, that's so nice, Girish. I mean, very interesting perspective, right? Where I can um, customize my own process. I can play it to the style. Um, yeah, Pooja, right? Yeah, just, uh, just a couple of things I just want to add to what Girish said and completely echo everything that he said, right? So right now in this war for talent, interviews are 
is actually a place where the employer should do the live branding right of themselves of their story right so that's where we ha- at gsk have trained hiring managers on couple of things right one is uh is to be more uh, sympathetic as well as show empathy to the candidates right because everybody in this pandemic is dealing with various uh, situations and there are times that you know last minute interviews get cancelled or background noise because they're working from home right so that is one thing uh, that we have uh, kind of trained all hiring managers uh, to be more empathetic towards candidates and use the first few minutes of the conversation to kind of break the ice to check in with them in terms of what they how are they dealing with the pandemic right and uh, we also use that time to showcase as to what we at gsk are doing to make uh, employ to help uh, employees deal with the pandemic so that is one of the trainings that we have provided to hiring managers in terms of empathy and the second one that we have done which has really helped us is in terms of uh, giving training on unconscious bias right uh it could be like you know a both positive uh, unconscious bias that you know you're looking at candidates who are coming from certain companies so you have this preconceived notion that you know they're really good or it could work even the negative way that you know these are candidates who are coming from let's take tier 3 organizations right uh and they might not click right so that's where uh, the, the uh, training that we have done on unconscious bias has also helped us in terms of getting better results from uh, these interviews so just those two points uh, that i wanted to add uh, to what uh, girish uh, said great great thanks thanks pooja i mean unconscious bias i'm still figuring out what is that i don't no which uh, will i accept it to the external world but then if it is a structured training that would definitely yeah. help me to self reflect on it beautiful i mean uh, good luck on that initiative i uh, on on the same lines um, rohan uh, this is also about building your brand story effectively right and training also plays a role in it uh, if you could add uh, some of your perspectives that would be great the thing is especially with hiring managers particularly uh i mean they are not just doing the hiring part i think we sometimes miss that out right they are your point of contact in many ways your thing so i think as a rule not as a rule but if they are up for it you should try making as many hiring managers possible as your brand ambassadors right like many organizations already have the brand ambassador concept but um, Insta- apart from just training them on how to do the interviews well do it online and, and and be fair and remove all that sense of bias we have to remember some of these candidates are probably looking doing multiple interviews doing multiple uh, uh, offers I, i i know all of you are smiling and shaking your heads for 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 these times but that being said it's the reality right a lot of the times at those interviews not only are we trying to see if they are going to be a fit the job seekers are try- also trying to understand would this company be right for me and hiring managers need to be trained in conveying all this information that we are anyways going to be putting out there in employer branding and in some cases are just a little better they need to talk have a good understanding of the values of the organization and how it fits into uh, uh you know the company uh and how it fits into how the company works is one thing to have values and one thing to put it on your career side i think the best source of information about how these values play out in your organizations would be the hiring managers and of course uh, they can also use that opportunity to personalize the process right by understanding the employee or the sorry the job seeker at that time they can personalize the candidate experience uh you know kind of give them information or not just that the hiring manager can take the information that they have received during the interview if they can pass it on to the talent acquisition professional or the recruiter how great would it be that post that interview they get a like a small package with information that they they sort out you know i think there are a lot of loops that we we are probably doing because one of the very common things that we ask at the end of any interview is do you have any questions for me and the hiring manager tries to answer it to the best of their ability but are we closing the loop with hr and saying hey guess what this is what this candidate was interested in maybe we can take that and, and put it there uh, i think all hiring managers at some level should be given the same training uh, a brand ambassador is given so that they understand not just the values 
uh, all the programs for example any program that is uh, got any for example you know attuned towards improving the number of women getting into the workforce if if it's a male hiring manager they may not be that into our in depth understanding of that program maybe they need to be having that conversation with their existing work you know hr and ta folks so that when when someone who's a diverse who who who's a good candidate who can benefit from these programs comes into it into an interview they can also convey that information right just because you don't benefit from the program doesn't mean we can't share that information so there are a lot of things uh we could be doing to train hiring managers to get them to understand that that the organization is more than just the team that they are hiring for right there's a lot more happening and if they can convey that to job seekers uh i i it's 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 an immense process right i think as a marketer marketing background if you told me there's an opportunity to make a customer sit right in front of me and i can talk to them for one hour about why they should go with this organization that's a great opportunity and we're getting that at the same time in these interviews so we should definitely leverage those opportunity that's that's a beautiful perspective but i don't want my hiring manager to know it right if he knows then the value for him or her in the organization goes a couple of notches higher no just kidding looking at it from multiple perspectives right not just uh, any training on how do you talk to a candidate it's also about how do you represent your organization it's also about building those bridges as you rightly said if you can build a feedback loop and bring that information and feed it into the organization so that it becomes a process very 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 interesting so this is data collection right this is what we call data collection nothing else it's not that only the systems need to capture the data it's we as humans if we can look for these opportunities we think our job is over once the interview is done no right i mean you come back and diligently fill that form and have a moment of sharing with your hr team that helps a lot uh thank, thanks thanks much ron so i'm, I'm just heading to uh, pooja for this question now we are talking about data we are also talking about some of the challenges and we all know hiring is an eternal challenge right anyone who says i have solved for hiring i think they deserve an incredible prize uh, i don't think anyone would have solved for hiring but it's it's an ongoing process right um, this is a beautiful process for example around 90% of the time we think we control the process but the moment the offer moves from our desk and reaches the candidate they control the process we absolutely have no control on it we play with the merits and demerits of the candidate right so it's 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 very very interesting if you travel this path of 25 30 45 90 days along with a candidate and all of us are eager to convert his stamp from a candidate to an employee in this entire process right what are some of the data points you look at how has data really helped you to streamline this process in fact this is one question for all three of you i'll probably start with you sure so i think that is the beauty about uh, using technology right now we have uh, so many tools available which helps us capture data at every stage and how we as recruiting uh, leads can start using some of this data in order to derive various trends right like for example uh, when um, the offer renege rate was extremely high at gsk we decided to capture different aspects of data like for example why are candidates reneging which are the companies uh, from which they are getting uh, counter offers from and what is those increases like and what are the other uh, joining perks that you know companies are offering so we started collecting all of this data and we started analyzing this data and what we could uh, find from all of this data was you know that for certain grades for these kind of uh, skills uh, you know compensation was the main um, reason right or it was location and it also gave us insights that uh, there are certain organizations which are maybe giving like you know uh, one time retention bonus to all of their staff right so we use that data that we got uh, at an offer reneg or offer drop out stage and we uh, used it for sourcing and scheduling so whatever that we were sourcing we try to uh, avoid candidates from those companies because we knew that if we schedule them if we reach out to them then the risk of them not joining us is much higher 
right? So that's how we were able to use some of this data. And uh, another thing that we do at GSK is we have a very strong post offer engagement program that we call as the red carpet event. And thanks to the pandemic, it's actually now done virtually. So this is a forum wherein all of the candidates who are yet to join, they get to interact with senior leaders and they get to understand more about GSK's culture, right? So we started collecting even data from these connects uh, in terms of what are the kind of questions that these candidates are asking uh, and uh, how, uh, how engaged they are during these conversations that they're having with senior leaders and hiring managers, right? So using that data, we were able to kind of uh, analyze you know the predictability of these candidates to join right so this is just one example wherein using data we have been able to improve the predictability of a hire right we were able to map out the, the RHG, you know the red amber and green of these candidates joining so that's how we were able to plan for backup so i think collecting data and especially using the kind of tools that we have in terms of AI, ML, and um, the data analytics, we will definitely be able to improve uh, the quality as well as the speed of recruitment that we are able to do. Thanks, thanks, Puja Girish. So, a uh, very, very interesting perspective shared by Puja. And I think during the course of this conversation, one thing that's been established is that there is a lot of data that's available, right? And there are multiple sources. You have the technology that's available today, the kind of applicant tracking systems you have. I think there's a lot of data that today is available at the beck and call of every single organization. And but having said that, I think one thing that what you typically realize is that all the data that you collect during hiring, I think it needs to be interpreted in the context in which it is collected. Right? And that's been a learning for us in a major way. What I when I mean the context in which it's collected, what I'm referring to is the talent that you meet in the market, are you able to segment that talent into various categories and then try to understand the data better? Now to do that, you can't have, you can't look at data analytics in isolation. You need to have an internal assessment capability and a process that is enabling you to segment data when you look at talent in the market and then validate with the data that's coming out and that typically helps you to make meaningful interpretation of data and to take the right decision. Let me give a small example for instance. Okay. For example, when we, so if you let, let's, let's uh, uh, imagine that if you have to categorize all the talent that is available in the market, say into a two by two grid of demand and supply being high and low, right? And when you look at the quadrant which would typically represent the high demand and low supply. I think we spoke about it some time back. Uh, so which could, let's, let's, for the purpose of this discussion, assume could be in the tech world, it could represent uh, people with skill sets of say, artificial intelligence, machine learning, data science, and so on and so forth. Now, what we've historically seen is that this particular quadrant, people belonging to, or talent belonging to this particular quadrant have been paid differentially compared to the rest of the quadrant. Right, and this has been established in through various surveys by calling it premium skills, whatever you want to call it. But one uh, interesting trend that we have noticed, noticed through our own analytics is that the trend between these, I mean, the line between these quadrants is now very, very distinctly blurring. Right, and what we are noticing is that, and talent with not so premium skill sets as well getting lucrative offers out in the market right and that 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 that's definitely raising questions of sustainability now being on top of the data analytics play in the manner that i've just mentioned has helped us to ensure that we we are possibly avoiding the mistake of trying to looking at problem skills i mean the skills for problem solving abilities which, which is a common mistake that most recruiters and hiring managers these days and many companies have seen make. It helps us to then make optimal offers to the candidate, right? Now, one other thing that I've, okay, that's that, that uh, uh, we've, we've looked at more in terms of how the play of analytics works there. At the more operational level, I think how analytics has really helped us is to, it's, it's kind of helped us to unravel and understand how various organization structure offers, like Pooja made a mention about whether it's retention bonus, what kind of 
what kind of components are typically uh, being offered? Because I'm quite sure each of us would have faced situations where you've got a business lead or a business manager or a hiring manager walking up and saying, and talking about some obscene number that's being offered by competitors and how do we really react to it, right? But then being on top of the data play helps you to respond rather than react abruptly in such situations, right? Because you do find that many times that if you get into the details of some of these offers that are being made, it could be a play of, say for instance, uh, uh, it, it could be a simple play where the, the competing organization is representing, you're trying to use a different appraisal cycle or a reward cycle to show a completely different cash flow to the candidate and represent it as part of the CTC. So one way we've been able to address that is to demonstrate annual cash flow to the, to the candidate, not only in terms of how we structure the packages, but also in terms of the competing offers. Right? That, that's, that's been one way how we've been able to use analytics in that sense. The last but not the least, one very, very interesting way how we've also used this is we're not restricted only to hiring, but also to ensure that our internal talent is priced appropriately with respect to these evolving trends. So these, these have been some of uh, the ways how we've been able to benefit uh, from uh, the data analytics that we spoke about. Very interesting. Thanks, Kirish. I mean, demonstrating the cash flow to the candidate, right? So that's where all of us go wrong. Uh, we all want more and more take home. And there's always, we, we are in the middle of that joke strong where what HR promises and what you take home is totally different. If you could give that in a credible way, nothing like it. That's very interesting. And Rohan, your views. Sir. The thing is about data right now, uh, that a lot of companies have been collecting it for a long time, right? Uh, and, and the thing is within the organization, and the funnel information is pretty good. Uh, and I think in this day and age of data and analyzing, it's, of course, it's very critical when it comes to attracting the right candidates, uh, particularly things like conversion metrics and things like that. Uh, now, let me talk from my perspective, what I've seen. Uh, there are few areas where we are seeing dropouts and, and a lot of the times we attribute it to something else, right? Like, for example, we see a lot of people uh, coming to our career site, not applying, and, and we might be saying, hey, maybe it's, it's, they're not just interested in the job. But a lot of the times what can happen is maybe they have not understood the process completely. Like I work a lot with companies where we talk about job description starting right there, right? I'm saying if we are having people read your job description but not apply, maybe it's not, I mean, we make the assumption is they're not interested in the role. But uh, there are other ways to approach that uh, drop-off ratio, right? Uh, the fact of the matter is in many cases, there is a misunderstanding about what the role is all about. Uh, and, and it's not the recruiter's fault. The recruiters who are hired to do a role, they, they're not content experts, they're not content writer. Uh, I, I, I always say we, you should be reaching out to your marketing teams and talk to the experts. Uh, there are SEO experts who've been working on things like this for the last 10 years, who've been fine tuning one word on a, on, on, on a single page on your website just to make sure someone sees it. You know, and, and it's things like that, that, that and, and the reason they make that change to that one word on that one page on your website is because the data is telling them that. And I think we need to start using similar things where we look at these conversion metrics and see where the drop off is happening. Is it employer branding? Is it the description that we are? Are we conveying the right information? I, I really liked how Grish was talking about showcasing all, you know, the, the cash flow and things like that. And that's, those are interesting things that job seekers care about, right? It will actually help uh, in the long run when we share all this information that they care about uh, as well. We see a lot of drop off during the interview stage. We, we assume it's because they didn't uh, like the interview process, but maybe it was the fact that at this stage, they figured out the pay is not what they were expecting it to be. Like if we had been upfront right then, our conversion at the top of that funnel, the metrics at the bottom would, would, would have gotten much better. And, and the use of data to find the right people can go beyond that, right? We do, we, and indeed, we talk about sharing information about labor markets, right, in, in specific areas and locations. And we use the data, like how many people are searching for uh, software engineering jobs? How many people are searching for these kind of jobs? A lot of companies uh, decide to set up operations. They try to hire, uh, and I've heard it, of course, like we want 50 of these 
kind of roles and i'm like are there 50 people who can do that role in this location uh, should we be looking at it at a much broader scale right rather than just having this office right here should we be looking at all of this so at every stage even before and i think that's where hr and talent acquisition can become a very strategic partner to the business like even before we say we need 50 people we need to go back to business and say can we even do 50 people in this one location should we be thinking about it from a larger scale should we be going somewhere else and i think data can play that role right uh -huh. to make hr and talent acquisition a much more strategic role very very true i'm an interesting conversation um one one last question for Sridhar. Um, this is around the uh, gig economy and also about uh, temporary workforce um you know the gig economy uh, you know uh, takes the question a little bit uh, different direction you know typically when we talk of temporary workers it is the contract uh, you know contractors that we hire is what we talk about you know how do we bring uh, contractors onto a workplace but since you mentioned gig economy, I want to go a little further on that and, and talk a little bit about uh, certain initiatives that we have done and, you know, many players in the industry are doing that. Is in terms of crowdsourcing, right? You know, there are orga organizations, especially in the current gig economy, um, there are a lot of technology professionals out there who are ready to, um, you know, be a part of the uh, organization to provide and contribute for specific initiatives or specific projects. And uh, organizations are looking to tap them. And you know, if there is a crowdsourcing platform available where you can actually put up your, um, you know, project or your, you know, requirement, um, there will be tons of experts available. And this is not necessarily in India. This is global, global talent pool that is available, which can, you know, pick up that project, complete the project, and then, you know, submit the code. And then, of course, you can, you can um, give them a prize based on, you know, uh, the best selection, etc. It's a it's a two two way advantage. One is you know for the organization, the benefit is that you know you're not engaging that person forever. Um, you just have to have a platform where you register these technology experts, and you can post your challenges, and whoever is interested will take it up, and you will have to set some appropriate uh, prize money for that. Uh, to the to the candidates, you know the advantage is that you know everybody doesn't work like 20, 20 hours every day, right? You know they have eight hours of working. Uh, you know, and maybe 10 to 12 hours of work in, the, uh, in, the, in their current uh, job, they would still have opportunity over the weekends or, you know, uh, at, uh, late in the night when they, they want to exercise this coding skills. It is a productive time for them not only to uh, challenge their minds, but also to earn out of that, right? And a lot of um, uh, youngsters would want to do that. And so this kind of crowdsourcing is, a, you know, is, is something that is developing as a, um, you know, as, as a um, mechanism of getting temporary uh, work done, uh, short-term projects done through temporary workers. And uh, the only challenge in this space is essentially to ensure that you, you have the right, you know, your customers will be uh, picky in terms of do you have the right candidate, you know, what kind of um, background checks have been done, etc. And as long as organizations can ensure through the registration process that they have all of these covered, I think uh, this is something that is uh, here to stay and uh, benefit the organizations. Now, with this, um, what we do is we, we come to the end of this session. Uh, I think uh, we had some great insights coming in. I, I certainly like that concept of about uh, exposing not just your cash flow, also your opponent's cash flow, right? The competitors, whatever is the offer they're making, throwing that. Uh, and what's more interesting to see is if someone would have walked into this uh, conversation midway, they wouldn't have realized there are some HR guys sitting here and having a conversation. It was more business. It was more meaningful. And I think uh, we had a lot of insights, good takeaways from each one of us. Thanks. Thanks a lot. We had a wonderful conversation and nice catching up with each one of you. Thank you. Well, what a dynamic conversation this was. Thank you so much, Girish, Pooja, Rohan, Sridhar, and Babu. I'm sure the audience enjoyed this conversation because I surely did. Keep sharing your learnings and reflections from the summit to the outside community using the hashtag ETHRNextTech.